please join me in welcoming uh, Kevin Phelan, co-chairman of the firm, head of our capital markets group. He will be joined by uh, Jeff Black, a rock star, uh, Tony Hayes, a rising star with the investment sale group, uh, our multi-family investment broker, uh, Chris Sauer, and the multi-talented uh, uh, multi development services group, Jocelyn Golia. Kevin? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, audience. We're going to try to have some fun this morning, or this afternoon rather, with the capital markets and investment sales people and Jocelyn from the development side of uh, Collier's. Uh, we're going to make this fast moving and I might interrupt him and move on to somebody else, so uh, bear with us and tolerate us. I'm going to start with Chris Sauer. Uh, Chris, a uh, question that I think people are asking right now, it's alluded to before, is the rhythm between cap rates and interest rates. Where's it going? Uh, and then I'm going to have Jeff also kind of weigh in on that. So Chris, Chris Sauer. Well, I think to start to answer that question, I mean, we all benefited from being in Boston and being lucky that it's an amazing market. You know, nationally, we're top three markets in the country. Internationally, you could see different, different reports, but probably top five. Um, you know, in that, it's, it's a great market to be in. From the multifamily perspective, your cap rates right now in the institutional class A core product is call it a four to four and a half, maybe lower in some cases, depending on the opportunity. Um, but in that, it, it's extremely competitive. Um, how cap rates are going to relate to interest rates, there's a correlation. However, it doesn't affect all buyer profiles that are out there. In our opinion, it's, it's more going to impact the leverage buyer that's looking for getting as much leverage as they can and less impactful to the international buyers or the institutional buyers where it's not as much of a driver. So I'm going to interrupt you. Jeff, what's your yeah. thought on rates and where the rhythm is? I think it's important to point out that. Right, uh, with me. This is where it's going to go. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to point out that, you know, for all the chatter uh, going on post election with, you know, creeping interest rates, today we're still staring at the lowest all time rates this country's ever seen for borrowing costs. You know, your benchmark 10 year deal on a conservative downtown, you're still at or below 4% for, for core lending. It, it's, it's still boom times for the lending markets, and it's, it, we've got to keep that in mind. Chris, I'll come back to you. I'll give you some more ink time. Sure, uh, love it. Where does the institutional all-cash buyer fit with the leverage buyer? Um, comparatively, I mean, they're in similar markets. Um, they have been in 2016. I think they're going to start to shift out. I think the leverage buyer is going to look for more return. Um, and again, if rates go up, uh, you can borrow less, and that directly impacts what you can pay for real estate if you're a leveraged buyer. The institutions and the international capital are not as reliant on that. The international capital is even looking at it as more asset preservation than they are about what the return is because they're looking for a safe haven. They look at Boston as that, a good place to park money long term. Tony, yes. uh, picking up on that, we're seeing right now that some clients of ours are running, having you and Jeff run a parallel track. Mm -hmm. Should we sell it? Do we finance it? And how do you run that, that process? Well, it's clear for, for a lot of assets that there's a, there's a capital event forthcoming, whether it's just taking advantage of today's market or there might be a loan maturity. And what we're doing more and more is putting together two books. We're putting together a sales book and we're putting together a financing book, both running our processes and seeing where the chips fall. And what it does, it can really help facilitate a sale because we've already fully vetted the debt markets and probably have identified what the best terms are. But also, if we put really good debt at today's rates on a property, it's an attribute that might push it over the edge 6, 12, 18 months from now. Obviously, one of the other obviously exits, notwithstanding sale or financing, is the 1031. Where does that fit in the scheme of alternatives on the back end of a deal? It's still a huge aspect of the market, <coughs> uh, particularly since probably 2012 when the tax code changed. But it's, it's a situation. We have probably $200 million worth of, of sales right now under contract where one, two, or both of the parties are in a 1031 exchange. So we're able to fit it in a sales process where we can tighten it up if, if there's a timeline crunch on the front end, but we all can also structure something where there's a longer leash where if someone needs to identify to be able to pull their money out and replace it somewhere else. We're going to get off the money game for a second and ask Jocelyn to talk about construction costs and labor, availability of labor. Jocelyn. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, for the last three or four years, we've certainly seen about a 6% annual increase in construction costs, about a half percent monthly, and we don't see that slowing down. But thank you for bringing up labor. I think that's a really important piece of that puzzle. Right? We, we know that the, the pipeline right now in downtown is incredible, and we're starting to feel that labor squeeze a little bit. But when we talk about labor, zoom out and think about what's happening in the greater New England region. Um, because we're going to pull that labor from the whole region, not just from downtown Boston. In Maine right now alone, there are two healthcare projects worth a billion dollars 
we're seeing massive. That's in Portland, Maine, gang. Yeah. <laughs> we're seeing massive projects happening that are just pulling those resources. So if the projects that are in the pipeline scheduled for the next four to five years happen and come out of the ground, are we not now not talking about bringing labor in from Rhode Island? Or are we now talking about bringing guys in from Alabama? And what does that do to the overall construction cost? Well, you're here. I, I don't mean to be a doomsdayer, but if you were to see an economic downturn or a dip, where does that fit in costs? Where, what might you anticipate? Well, we're so lucky in Boston that the med-ed sectors are, um, are, are so strong in our economy here. And those projects are likely, are typically need-based and are funded in advance. So if the commercial uh, projects were to maybe tap pause and, and take a minute, we do think that the demand would still be so high for the med-ed uh, sectors that it would keep construction really booming, at least for the next few years. Great answer. Uh, going to come to Jeff Black. Uh, we see nearly $150 billion of CMBS product maturing this year. Uh, is there a place for this to land? Will it be rewritten by the CMBS market? Do life companies pick it up? Where do the banks fit in? In addition, uh, we have the, the overhang of Dodd-Frank and where that's going to fit in this new administration. Will it be uh, taken apart? Basel III, uh, risk retention rules. Where does this fit, Jeff? you got thank, about a half an hour. Yeah, thank you for the loaded <laughs> question. Uh, you know, CMBS 1.0, which was the 0607 boom time vintage era, that was when you know, we all got a little ahead of ourselves. We underwrote 18-month you know, pro forma rents today and got leverage off that. Uh, we've been fortunate that the upcoming wall of maturities, you know, 2016 and 17, that we're coming into as we speak. Uh, fortunately, the low interest rate environment and you know, strong economy has allowed many people to get out of those loans that may be over leverage otherwise. What we're seeing is a lot of those d deals that you know, would be due to be paid off this year, a lot of savvy borrowers got ahead of the curve and either defeased or prepaid those loans in 2016 and just bit the bullet, prepaid the penalty costs, and just figured if I can, if I can roll out of a 6%, remember 6% was a great deal back in 06, and we all thought that was you know, the best of times. If you can reduce your borrowing costs 2% and it costs you a couple hundred grand to roll out early, that's a win-win for you. Jeff, you brought up the other day in our conversation about some of the funds that have matured, maturing opportunities, and there are some people that are stepping in to pick up on these. Would you might develop that a little bit? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I won't name names, but there are well-known funds uh, throughout the United States right now who are out capital raising as we speak to, what in their minds, pick off expiring funds. You know, these, you know, whether it's a five or seven year hold and you're, it's a forced exit in what people may perceive to be a somewhat more favorable client to be a buyer in 2017. We'll stay with Jeff again. I know we're talking about the, the financing side, but how about from a location point of view, suburbs versus city? What are the suburbs, what are the city, what are their advantages of being one end or the other? You know, whether it's raising JV equity or placing, you know, just vanilla long-term permanent debt, uh, if you're going to be downtown, it's got to be a core location. I can't stress enough how important transit has become. It's really the be-all, end-all in terms of how decisions are made. The red line, it's, it's not... It's not hype, it, it, it is internationally recognized for being where you wanna be. We're also seeing domestic capital get increasingly comfortable with the inner urban ring, the Chelsea's, the Everett's. Quincy at one point was considered secondary. That's now, it's red line centric. You've got Malden, Medford, those markets that are about to be directly connected to the city of Boston by the Silver Line extension that opens in March for the first time in history. 40 minute commute goes to 15. International domestic capital is flooding those markets. And it's all transit-based. If you pivot out to the suburbs where transit kind of cuts off, your counterpoint equivalent, whether you're a lender and you say, where do I want to invest my you know, debt capital, or your equity, it's the live, work, play environment. That's, you know, that's how you compete, whether you're anchored by a grocer, whether it's you know, Boston Properties and the Demoulis family at 1265 Main out in Waltham, or it's the Norblum family up in Burlington with Third Ave anchored by Wegmans and you know, national development. It, these really dynamic clusters are where we enough time. We're going to move back to Chris. <laughs> Thank you for cutting me off. <laughs> <laughs> I relieved him. Uh, Chris, institutional. Back to institutional. The entrepreneurial investor, the family office. Yeah. Uh, Boston is a place to invest, and Tony might comment because Tony, yeah. you're involved in a downtown sale right now with a foreign investor. Mm -hmm. Boston is a place to be. Where does it fit? 
guys in the scheme of international. Yeah, I'll take it. I mean, it's, again, top market in, in, the, in the country and also na internationally. Um, you know, I think it's people look at Boston and say it's such a diverse economy, it's such a strong educational base, and that's really attractive in terms of what you can offer inv investors and sound fundamentals. There's been a lot of talk about GE and Reebok and the impact that those guys, those employers are going to have on our market, which is huge, but really looking deeper into it and seeing that they're coming here to rebrand their companies as young, innovative companies, and Boston is the place where they want to do that, I really think speaks volumes. And mm -hmm. what that does from a national perspective, an international perspective, is huge. I mean, 2016, we, we all heard it in our world, everyone wanted to be in the core, they wanted to be infill, they did not want to go outside of 128. Um, that has started to change because it is so impossible and so difficult to buy something in that market with the yields the way they are. So we're starting to see a shift, something I can, Jeff can talk on the equity, but starting to see some shift where you know, groups like the Mount Vernon Company and Post Road Residential are looking outside to some of the markets that Jeff talked about where you're able to get yield, you're able to get opportunity. There isn't a whole lot there, but typically there's good transit to build off of and then you're building communities, you're investing there, and in theory it's giving, giving better yield. In the last six months, we've seen equity start to really look that way as mm -hmm. viable options. It has to check certain boxes. Well, we're talking about equity. Uh, Tony and then yes. Jeff, would you comment on the holding period? We've heard, traditionally heard of the, the bill to sell, the merchant builder, the three to seven years hold. What is your read on it? And then, Jeff, is there longer money available for equity? Well, it's, it's evolving due primarily to the, the new type of buyers, the, the generational, particularly international buyers that are here. They have a completely different time frame when they invest here. But for a traditional sort of office or industrial deal, I think we're probably, due to the point in the cycle, we're probably at the three, five, seven-year hold periods because we're probably at a point where you can't nece necessarily rely on capital market timing and additional cap rate compression to create value. You Jeff, do you see longer money available for your clients? You know, th there's, there's two schools of thought, you know, and, and I'll speak to domestic capital because the foreign capital really views us as a safe harbor, so that's it's a different animal. But the domestic capital recently, you know, that I just spoke of earlier that's pushing into this outer ring and chasing a little bit more yield, there's two schools of thought there. One is, okay, I'm gentrifying, I'm going into an emerging market, I get in, I get out. But at the same time, there's clients that we're speaking to now who we're investing with them in projects and all they have is short-term capital, so they're kind of forced into that kind of merchant build scenario. They're actively out right now raising more evergreen long-term capital because the other side of the coin is if I'm going into emerging market, why not wait 10 years until it's got critical mass? Good. Tony, yes. come back to you. Uh, product of choice right now. I know you're involved in the... Globe sale, Jeff's involved in the financing of the Globe. Mm -hmm. There's a movement to the south side of the city. There are other locations and, and product. What's the choice? Where do people want to be in? In terms of just general market volume, office and industrial still rule the day on the commercial side, but but in particular with Chris the is going to say it's all apartments. So <laughs> all apartments. They all work together. We're all one big effort uh, But in terms of the Globe, it, it may look sort of on the surface as a pioneering opportunity, but when you peel it back a little bit, it checks all the boxes. It's a critical mass development opportunity that may turn out heavily multifamily, maybe office. It'll probably end up some mix of the both. It is adjacent to higher ed, which is a huge thing. And it's been mentioned a few times, it's on the red line. It's one of the few large projects available on the red line. So we've had all sorts of domestic and international institutional quality capital chasing it. Great answer. And it allows me to take, come back to Jocelyn. You talked earlier about the meds part of our economy. Let's talk about the EDS. What do you see as a role in educational institutions in Boston and other opportunities for the real estate industry? Yes. Um, all the we're, above. <laughs> we're seeing all of the above. We're seeing uh, our educational institutions here in Boston, small and large, really take a look at their existing real estate assets and I think in a more creative way than they have before, investigate whether unlocking those assets might create any uh, meaningful and uh, interesting opportunities. Great. Well, before I turn it back to Jim and, and thank my panel and thank the audience, just a couple of observations. Obviously, we have, we're, we're blessed with the financial services, high tech, pharma market, but I think as Jocelyn well pointed out, the meds and eds are still a constant underbelly, so we're, we're fortunate here. Observation one. Observation two, and picks up on Jeff, uh, equity is forgiving on locations. I don't think there's that old prejudice of address anymore. I think the location is the right thing, especially with the, the transit ankle that uh, Tony, uh, Chris, and Jeff all mentioned. 
And uh, as an observation of future locations, uh, Tony mentions the Globe. I think we're going to see Melanie Cass Boulevard, Brighton, south side of the city, witness what's going on out at New Balance uh, to the west side of the city. The city's spreading out, and I think uh, uh, John Fish helped uh, with his Olympic effort, albeit didn't come to pass with highlighting Wadette Circle. Where's the city going to be? I think that's our job, both as colliers and working with uh, people like you as to where Boston is going. And uh, finally, uh, a commercial, there's plenty of debt plenty of equity money. So I thank you all. Thank you, my panel. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah.